Hello everyone and thank you Physio TV and uh, Dr. Manish Ray for inviting me as a panelist for today's session. So I take a great pleasure to introduce today's eminent speaker, Ohan Lambeck. He is a pioneer in the aquatic therapy. He's a physiotherapist, BHS and certified hydro from United Kingdom. He's a senior lecturer association in international aquatic therapy faculty, which is IDF from Valence Badragas, which is in Switzerland. He has almost a teaching experience in 50 plus countries. He is former head department in aquatic therapy in St. Martin's Clinic Rehab Center, Nijmegen, Netherlands. And he is a former free research associate in Leuven University, Belgium. He is the recipient of 2020 award Excellence in Aquatic Physical Therapy by the Academy of Aquatic Physical Therapy, APPA, USA. He is also a Cochrane member in scientific chair of the ISABAT Congresses. In research case, he has almost 605 citations, IDEX 11, and RG score of 24.79. So welcome, Ohan. I'm looking forward to the great presentation as always from you. Thank you, Dipti, for the um, introduction, and thank you, Manish, for the invitation to uh, to talk about this topic. And uh, first of all, your Dutch is not so good because it's called Nijmegen. It's very difficult to pronounce, but don't worry. Um, and I have to warn everybody who's listening because I go to rush through the slides in the beginning because I know I have way too many, but it's a very interesting topic. Yeah, that uh, is evolving then. And um, anyway, I know that's going to be recorded, so you can always um, leisurely look it back at some moment um, at your convenience. Um, so these are the discussion objectives. Yeah, so we talk about the executive functions, but based on the information that you see before and that it's about um, low-grade inflammation, yeah, the cytokines, and especially lifestyle, the effects on the immunometabolic system, et cetera, yeah? So this is how I will rush through the slides. So you know this now, yeah? And interesting, last December, the WHO produced a new guidelines on physically activity and sedentary behavior in which they gave the key, the, the key messages that everybody knows by now. And that is that physical activity is good. We have to move, it's good for your hearts, bodies and they say also the minds and with this actually they talk about cognition yeah. every step counts don't sit so what i do now is wrong because i'm sitting here yeah? i should stand and you too also interesting just a few days ago the world obesity federation published yeah um January. Yeah, this report on clinical care for obesity. Um, and on the right side, you see a report, a leaflet by the World um, Heart Federation. The message is move. My message then is clear. When you can move on land, then go into the pool. And I want to show you the advantages of moving in the pool logically then. A bit longer ago. Yeah. This is a very nice uh, publication from 2017 from England. It says that it's about swimming and the health and well-being benefits of swimming, but actually it's about exercise and water and you read well. And then one of the authors, Dr. Moffat, addresses um, the cardiometabolic system and neurology in the, chapter, in the first chapter. And what she says is in bold that water-based exercise prescription should be a key consideration for all healthcare clinicians, providers and commissioners. Actually, they say, think of the pool always in every prescription. Yeah, it's important for us yeah, to use this kind of information. And then I quote one of my Dutch colleagues, Ono Meyer from the University of Amsterdam and also working in China, said, when you look at the object of therapeutic interventions, uh, physiotherapy of lifestyle diseases, then, in fact, it's the inflammation of the hypothalamus. So you talk about the brain and mind cognition. Treatment is most effective when patients combine exercise with 
other things uh, like sensory experience, cognitive challenging, and social stimulation. And then the last sentence, only exercise will be less effective. Uh, and that's basis with, with the red line in this webinar. Not only exercise, but a bit more. Well, I guess everybody is knowledgeable about chronic low, and chronic low grade inflammation or systemic inflammation. Uh, there are different words for this. Um, knowing that the amount of cytokines that regulate inflammation um, are unbalanced, uh, too many pro inflammatory and not enough um, anti inflammatory cytokines. This activates uh, the immune system and has all kinds of uh, problems everywhere, including in the brain. Uh, we talk about neuroinflammation. Um, in many diseases, uh, when you look at literature, you see a whole list of diseases, and I want to focus a little bit on lifestyle diseases. Then, there we are. You don't move. You eat too much. Uh, you see uh, macrophage infiltration that leads to this chronic systemic inflammation, and finally with all kinds of disasters um, in the low part, including neurodegeneration. So once again, the brain, and how to intervene is training, eh? movement. I will repeat this a couple of times so you never forget this again. Metabolic syndrome has a whole array of problems, as you all know, <clears throat> and with some key words that I go to directly, and that is the dysfunction of the endothelium, yeah, the inner layer of your blood vessels. Of course, insulin uh, resistance, and, and once again, your inflammation. And when you look at literature, uh, you'll be reading for weeks, if not months, on articles on this. So uh, just some selections here, and like in this case, this is about your inflammation and the relation with diabetes. So there's lots of backup that sedentary lifestyle that leads to metabolic syndrome, including at some moment maybe diabetes, can lead to all kinds of problems in the brain. And when you talk about health issues and brain issues and cognition, then mostly you come up to executive functions, of course. That's also in the title of this PowerPoint, and we discuss this a little bit later. But especially these functions are vulnerable uh, to metabolic syndrome stress and also chronic pain, by the way. It is always this relationship uh, then, um, where there is a reciprocal relationship that practically means that, for instance, chronic pain influences um, executive functions and executive functions can influence chronic pain, both pathological and therapeutical, and that also comes with physical activity. Yeah, physical activity influences executive functions and executive functions can influence the way you move. And that's important for us then. It's not new that aquatic therapy has an effect on impaired glucose tolerance or effect on glucose resistance. In 2009 already there was this first publication that I found on aquatic therapy where the things in red yeah, are highlighted by me because they are important. Uh, they were doing things at an RPE of 11 to 14. So those patients became a little bit tired. Yeah. Moderate intensity was important. And then they did a circuit with influences um, on fasting glucose, etc. So already they knew that doing something in water might affect the glucose tolerance. And I say this, <clears throat> and I took these two um, articles to point out that many of the patients that we work with because of the fact that they have a neuromusculoskeletal disease or just a musculoskeletal disease, like in this case, osteoarthritis, chronic pain, and do have a sedentary life. So directly or indirectly, there is a relation with that sedentary behave style, uh, behave, <clears throat> behavior and lifestyle disease then. So we have to think about all these topics that I'm going to address actually in every patient, um, including in those patients that may have um, problems um, in patients with congestive heart failure, yeah, that can be a part of 
metabolic syndrome. Um, already also here in 2003, um, a colleague from, from Sweden found that movement in water, these are the blue bars, um, has positive um, effects in comparison to the control group, and these are the yellow to red bars, and on all kinds of topics, as you can see, that normally they, uh, they measure um, in cardiology, but including on the right side on quality of life, especially quality of life increased a lot by aquatic therapy. Um, just to say that even in these patients, it's no problem to go into the pool. Yeah, there are some exceptions, but in general, it's okay. An important nerve that is involved in insulin resistance in regulating um, glucose and metabolism is the vagal nerve, as you know. So addressing the vagal nerve seems to make sense. And there are two ways to address this nerve. You can do this in an efferent way and an, an afferent way. Yeah? So input and output. The best effects are in combination, as they say in literature. And that's nice, because water gives this gift for free. You go into the pool, as pointed out, for instance, by Pendergast in 2015 in the wonderful review on the effects of immersion and the physiology, where you see that you know, the vagal efferent activity increases. We already knew for the last 30 years that the sympathetic activity when you go into pool decreases, that means when you're not afraid or so, yeah, but only in the last decade, it was measured to increase also the vagal activity and that increases. So that's for free, yeah, the efferent pathway is there. There's also an efferent, sorry, I said the afferent, yeah, this is the efferent one, yeah, the efferent pathway, um, this comes from a theory from Thayer, yeah, the neurophysical integration model of Thayer, where they say, nothing to do with water directly, um, that when you use your medial prefrontal uh, frontal cortex, that is the area where those executive functions are supposed to be anatomically, you influence all kinds of subsys subsystems. As you can see, the hippocampus, the hypo hypothalamus, again, remember, I mentioned this one already. And finally, you will influence parasympathetic control. Yeah, and sympathetic control and influence heart rate, heart rate variability. So there's also the efferent effect. And, and that's something that you also have on land, but the afferent effect a bit less. Altogether, the pool seems to be a good environment to address the vagal system and so to address also the uh, glucose metabolism. <clears throat> um, I took this from uh, work from Albinet. Uh, it's a French group a couple of years ago publishing yeah, about vagal function and exec executive functions. Um, I'm very good in forgetting ends, I see functions. There we are. And what they did is comparing um, sedentary elderly with aerobics and swimming in one group. The other group was active stretch and balance exercise on land. And, and they were interested in, of course, co correlations. There are correlations between um, executive functions um, and in this theory, the vagal control <clears throat> and also condition. And they found there was no real correlation between the absolute condition, but a good correlation between um, executive functions and uh, vagal control. That means heart rate variability. Uh, and in many cases, they use one of the tasks that is related to a subdomain of exec executive functions, where the Stroop test, uh, that's the, the famous yellow, green, white that you see down there. Um, and finding that this only happened in the people that were in the pool doing aerobics and swimming. And as you can see, this was at a certain level of exertion. Yeah, they took the heart rate reserve, which is about the same as the RPE that I mentioned before. Well, 
And the theory of function I mentioned already, so let's look a bit more at that. And also there, there are many publications about lifestyle factors and endothelial function, et cetera, where we know that um, changes in insulin metabolism decreases this endothelial function, which is quite important because the endothelial function in vessels affects the ability of vessels to regulate their lumen, yeah, their, um, their space, um, to all kinds of changes in blood flow, demands, etc. cetera. Um, and it is done by nitric oxide. I don't want to go too much in this, but there is a big relation then between nitric oxide, uh, that's a relaxant for, for instance, the smooth muscles around the uh, metarial, the, 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 the vessels, uh, the met uh, arteriolates. That's not a good word, but anyway. Um, and um, there is a relation um, that is in, in, in red then um, with therapeutic effects and of course then also with water. So therapy is increase endothelial function and generate nitric oxide. Important also because the increase of this nitric oxide affects um, a very much studied neurotrophic factor that I think everybody knows, BDNF. Um, and BDNF as a neurotrophic factor is an antagonist of neuroinflammation yeah, of the pro-inflammatory cytokines that I will mention in a moment. Mm. BNF, yeah, the fertilizer of brain plasticity as they call it. Yeah, it's important for synaptogenesis um, and so on. Also angiogenesis, so it's important for learning. Yeah. Well then, this happens because of shear stress and shear stress yeah, pointed out here, is the friction between blood and the endothelial cells. The more friction, the more shear stress, the more um, uh, nitric oxide or endothelial nitric oxide synthesis, eh? that's the enzyme, um, affecting those little muscles over there, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah? Lots of literature you can um, go through. And now the pool. Because when you go into the pool, yeah, you change your circulation. Everybody knows this. That's hydrocentric pressure on the systemic uh, circulation. For a long time, we thought this only happens in the systemic circulation. That means not in the brain circulation. But uh, since a couple of years, yeah, and I can use this, uh, this slide that was given to me by Bruce Becker, that most of you will know at least from his book, a couple of years, and um, a group then compared the blood flow and yeah, velocity of blood you know, there. And after some time of immersion um, in two cerebral arteries, and in both cases, you see that the blood flow in water uh, is higher than on land there. So more velocity, more friction, more um, and that indeed happened. Right? That's another research that's also given to me by Bruce Becker. Then at least he made the, uh, the wonderful slide. Then, where in this case in treadmill training, they saw a clear increase in enos. There it is on the right. When you do this in water, as compared to when you do this on land, uh, the colors are a bit difficult, but this one exercise trained means after 12 weeks of aerobics uh, with 85% of the maximum oxygen uptake, uh, which is quite high then. So immersion increases the activity of the parasympathetic system. There is vascular stress that is more than on land. Then when you compare activities, yeah, there is also nitric oxide is being released. It's important for the BDNF you know, that helps the vascular compliance. Um, and that is all important in this um, insulin metabolism, uh, one of the problems in lifestyle diseases there. And this all adds to what they call the fesculoneuronal cop coupling. And that means that hemodynamic signals, the ones that I mentioned here, modify neuronal function 
and that can contribute to information processing then. And it's very new research of a, um, a colleague from Argentina, yeah, published in 2020 then. So cerebral blood flow is increased, uh, perfusion increases, and of course that's the basis for um, angiogenesis and all the other effects that I just mentioned. But if this is automatically good for neurons, uh, neuroplasticity, that is a bit the question, because if you don't use those brain cells in this area where you have more circulation, that perhaps nothing happens. So there's something else, um, um, and that is the neuronal metabolism itself then. And you can measure this with the amount of carbon dioxide yeah, that is produced because of metabolism of cells. It's called cere cerebrovascular reactivity. And they found that just swimming doesn't increase the CVR. So to put it black and white, in swimming you don't use your brain. And it's good for the circulation, yeah, but you don't use your brain so much. And in walking, this is already different. I mentioned PARFIT already. Yeah, some nice uh, researchers um, finding that also in stroke patients, there are increases in circulation, you see me measured by Doppler uh, there, so there's about blood flow, then <clears throat> um, showing the increase in cerebral blood flow or CVR, uh, that's the, the, the carbon dioxide effect, uh, then when you move in water, and in A, they compare this to moving on land. And you see land and aquatic finding, by the way, that's also important, that walking in water elicits the same effects in CVR or cerebral blood flow as running on land. So patients that are unable to run on land and can achieve this with walking in water then. And at a much lower mechanical stress. This is not vascular neuronal coupling, this is neurovascular coupling. This is the effect of blood flow based on using neurons. And metabolism increases, and these neurons need blood. And yeah, that's the CVR yeah, that I mentioned, in fact. And they found that in general, this neurovascular coupling is unaffected by only exercise. We have to do something else. And that's exactly the quote that I mentioned before. Um, and that was found in indeed Belevet also. So basically, this is the important topic. You move, moderate intensity, have to use your brain the same time then. All right, so in order to um, have a good metabolism of your brain, yeah, you need uh, vessels that are able to react. Yeah, nitric oxide is important, that's good. We are in the pool, we have all those advantages and you change arterial stiffness. And, and it's known, arterial stiffness is decreasing, during, uh, de decreasing much more during immersion exercise in water than on lens. Yeah, there are a couple of, um, authors that published about this in various groups, but they all found the same. So enough backup that going into the pool is good uh, for your arteries, for your vessels in general, including those into your brain. Um, well, one part of sedentary problems is that you get older, you move less, uh, inflammaging. You see increase in blood pressure, arterial stiffness changes, there's an arterial function, function that changes indeed. Yeah, and you see all kinds of neuropathology. Yeah? So this is one of the um, many graphs that you can find where aerobic exercise influences this all, as I said in the very beginning. Then. So neuroinflammation, yeah, that's something that happens in sedentary lifestyle, um, um, low-grade inflammation. Um, so this resistance of insulin affects also the brain indeed. Uh, that affects plasticity, finally. Mm -hmm. And of course, the whole brain is vulnerable 
but there are some structures that are more vulnerable than others, like the hippocampus, uh, your word memory, the prefrontal cortex, uh, that's where the executive functions are, and hypothalamus, um, that also my colleague in the Netherlands said we have to um, address them. Oh, these are the biomarkers you can read. I just continue with this. Um, but it's already found, was already found in 2011, that when you go into the pool, or this was with, uh, with animals, by the way, um, that you see anti-inflammatory properties. So these rats were swimming, um, and uh, they found in these rats with diabetes, by the way, um, that there was a clear decrease in the pro-inflammatory cytokines, um, increase in the anti-inflammatory one, especially interleukin, IL interleukin, 10 is an important one that pops up over and over again then. And more recently, this was also found in human beings with Parkinson, where this uh, Mex Mexican, this Brazilian group, um, basically said that a quadritherapy creates an anti-inflammatory environment there. And specifically, they looked at neuroinflammation. And here you see some other of the cytokines um, over there, uh, using activities at 60% of the VO2 max. Eh? That's an uh, intensity that is used a lot. So you have to move with regular intensity. Once again, patients have to get tired um, during our therapy if you want to address the brain properly, which was found also in patients with multiple sclerosis already many years ago by one of our colleagues here in Switzerland, in Valdregas in Valence, and then, where also during the 60% VO2 max activity of MS patients in the pool, in comparison to dry land, we found that when we have to look at this graph over here, that red, um, there was hardly increase over, and I believe it was six, seven weeks, um, in uh, BDNF, in the group that worked on land, on the bicycle ergometer, and a clear increase in the group that was doing things in water. And it's also known that if you want to have an effect on neurotrophic factors, that actually the activity must be higher than 60%. Yeah, uh, you need to have lactate, so to say, on land, where in water already, aerobic activity is enough. So patients that are not able to go to this high level of cardiac activity, for whatever reason, can go into the pool and with lower activity have the same effects on neurotrophic factors then. Um, that's, you see some, uh, some things about BDNF, that the correlation of the inverse correlation with pro-inflammatory cytokines, uh, there, yeah. and of course, the relation with cognition and executive functions, and that's also something that we will go into uh, soon, talking about how to do this then. Um, anaerobic exercise, I mentioned this, I leave it now, you can um, read, but if you would like to, to do anaerobic exercise in the pool, that is very well possible, actually very good. Um, this article by Cook in 2013, in the American Journal, uh, comparing blood lactates during sprinting in water and on land, found that you know, if you really let people sprint through water that is not too deep, by the way, otherwise you cannot sprint, um, um, that the lactates in water here in the last sentence um, are twice as high than on land, yeah, where the time of sprinting was always the same there. Well, continue with cytokines, but now the ones that are related to fats. Um, you see obesity, adipose tissue, and so on. There are two there that are very important. Yeah? So these are the cytokines that are made in, in fatty tissue, uh, the adipokines, so to say, uh, where adiponectin um, has this effect. Yeah? The inflammation effect is lowered, so you see this is anti-inflammatory and leptin is pro-inflammatory then. And we would like to have, of course, also a balancing effect uh, there by movement. And 
And there is something that you're able to do. By the way, this was done by Paula Geig of the United States. And, the re and this is a case report about somebody who was exercising in water and where they found this, um, uh, these effects. Um, um, meanwhile, there is more known about this. You see a lipid processing in the brain. <clears throat> um, it's important. Uh, it's a regulator of systemic met metabolism. And where does it happen? So the, the central, central part, that is the hypothalamus. That is exactly what my colleague from Netherlands also told. So you have to regulate yeah, those systemic met metabolism problems um, by trying to do something with the um, hy hypothalamus. Yeah. And the hypothalamus is found to be very sensitive for environmental enrichment, for all those extra um, stimuli that were mentioned, social, sensory, etc. If you do it as well, you see an increase of BDNF. You see the changes in the uh, in adiponectin and less and and and, le and leptin and um, um, aerobics work. Um, but less when it's only exercise. Eh? So once again, move and think. It can be effort in a relaxed way. You know, RP 10, 12, a bit more is also good. It doesn't have to be high activity. Um, so you go to giving stimuli. And if you do this in groups or not, this matters so much. Uh, but an important topic there that I, mean, I didn't mention yet is the physiospatial attentional work memory in which not so much the hypothalamus is active, but the hippocampus. And this is Dutch, bewegen means movement. So movement influences hippocampus, hypothalamus. So that's another important nucleus that was also depicted already in this model of neurophysical integration. But practically, and the message is known by um, at least some of you that have uh, listened to me before, is play. Question is if playing is physiotherapy, yes or no? Yeah, that's not for me, for you to judge. I think it is because these elements are important, challenging with success, etc., etc. But of course, based on what we want to achieve with our patients on dry land, yeah, that's all based on the uh, anamnesis and the assessment and goal setting according to ICF, for instance. And I'm not the only one that says play. And this is nothing to do with lifestyle. This is after early stroke, but it's a relatively recent <clears throat> activity, 2008, it's late. I think this is a mistake, I think it's 18. Um, yeah, it must be 18, um, where John Krakauer, this is Krakauer from uh, John Hopkins University, um, and said, well, you know, uh, we have to um, activate our hemiplegic patients. It was about arm function. And how it exactly went is not so important. That is computer program. But the title was Non-Task Oriented Approach yeah, based on high dose playful movements. Yeah, and that in therapy after early stroke. It's important. So, when you talk about executive functions, you talk about the executive function part of the brain or the attentional network. There is a large scale network that is, and can be found in all kinds of places, but where especially the, uh, <clears throat> the prefrontal cortex um, is important. Yeah, there we are, uh, the prefrontal cortex uh, over there, but you see it's not the only term, also the hippocampus is related and basal nuclei, et cetera. That's another network that we tend to forget sometimes, and that's the default mode network. And originally they said, well, it's one or the other. Uh, you see anticorrelation. That means if you are using this network, um, external attention, problem solving, uh, in goal-related uh, tasks, then the default network is less active. It serves for other things. Uh, more internal internal topics like mind wandering, contemplation, uh, self-generated thoughts, etc., encoding scenes and analogies, 
Um, uh, we're also linking immune function to behavioral states. And so probably it's also important to think how we can address that network. And meanwhile, we know uh, from recent literature that I just read last week um, that there is gray in between. It's not one or the other. Uh, sometimes you see that some parts of the, the brain are more externally focused and other parts are more internal focus, like the dolphin that can sleep and swim at the same time, so to say. With the executive network, uh, that's an important topic in this uh, uh, webinar, is about figuring out what to do in goal-oriented task. So you do something, you figure out. You move, you think. You are vulnerable to neuroinflammation, motor control, and of course, moving and thinking and motor control in our patients related to gravity problems, because that's why you go into the pool, is about, in many cases, preventing to fall. So fall prevention is an important other topic there. You have to use it or you lose it. How does movement affect this? Well, we have um, bones and muscles, so to say, and they found that if you start to load bones, which you also do when you're in the pool, I mean, there may be less axial pressure at the perpendicular there is enough, that there <clears throat> will be effects on, as you can see, metabolism, cognition, low-grade inflammation decreasing, because your osteoblasts, they produce osteocalcin. Yeah. So loading bones is important. Other one, of course, is loading muscles. Loading muscles means that uh, in contraction, you always have some cell death, so to say, and that means little inflammation reactions in your muscles and through all kinds of um, regulation systems, you see, um, we had an upregulation up -regulation, um, of, uh, there it is, uh, of um, interleukin 10 um, um, all over the body and affecting also the brain because they can pass the brain, the blood <coughs> brain barrier and have in, influence, uh, influences everywhere, including hippocampus, prefrontal cortex. So, again, in this executive function area. Um, increasing BDNF. So move, you see exercise has effects on BDNF, synaptic plasticity and cognition. Lots of literature that says, what is good for your heart is good for your brain. Exercise and think. Question is, do you have to do this at the same time or one after the other? One. And first of all, and physical activity needs executive functions and also there, there is quite an amount of research showing the relation between those ex executive functions, speed, agility, um, and physical exercise in general, dual tasking, obstacle course, etc. Yeah, that is clear, I hope, and I continue then, um, showing that moving and thinking indeed are anti-inflammatory. There are a couple of authors that looked at memory training, mindfulness training, exercise training, etc., cetera, exergaming, all um, about the fact that they found anti-inflammatory effects on these um, topics. Good. Executive network and aquatic therapy. Executive functions, mostly people use this threefold Topic that means inhibition to automatic responses, yeah? problem solving of the possibility um, to change your um, attention between tasks in a flexible way, yeah? um, moni monitor um, task yeah? while you do this, uh, that means memory updating, in which also this visual spatial attention um, is um, important. So you don't talk about routines. Uh, you talk about mm, novel activities. And the thing is there, do you think while you move or move while you think? 
No, there are two different topics. Um, we'll see. Anyway, when you go into the pool, already um, we make less mistakes than um, our short-term memory that was found by Edric Bressel that some of you might know from our conference we had a couple of years ago in India, um, where in a more recent publication he found that healthy elderly, um, you see, had 111 to 192% more mistakes during an audited task, standing in a difficult position, staggered on land in comparison to water. It was not really moving at a high level, it was just standing already there. And these are the effects of, as they postulate, the heart rate variability effects, uh, so the Fagel effect. There's some research about the fact that you are able to use executive functions nicely, and I mentioned these before, and some of you will know, so I will um, leave them now only mentioning that in this research from South Korea, they also use this RPE of 10, 13. So over and over again, you see, you have to move at some kind of intensity, which in many cases I see in all those 50 plus countries, um, that physiotherapists, our colleagues, not always do this. This were the task from Sato and Kang, and it, uh, from Kang, Kang, sorry, and, and they were playing. Topics there, there's you were task, and you have to react to somebody else. There's physical spatial uh, attention, and, and there is some uh, social activity. So there we are, yeah, dual tasking. But then it shouldn't be too easy. That's what we often do. And right? so you see this a lot. And this is with water. And then I always joke, you know, when you really want to get concentration, you have to ask the patient to put his portable phone and on, <clears throat> on the plate of the kickboard in this case. Yeah, then somebody gets concentrated, a bit afraid maybe, yeah, but anyway, concentrated, and that's the real double task. So don't make it too easy. It works because uh, Kim from South Korea did double tasks and found that when you look at intergroup effect sizes, that means the difference between doing things on land and in water, it was NDT land, water, dual task in the pool, mostly manipulating. There, there were big effect sizes. <coughs> um, uh, 2.65 in the Berg balance scale, for instance, that is really enormous uh, uh, difference. So dual tasking works yeah, quite well in, in the pool. Um, then, where, as I say, motor control is often related to fault prevention. So we have to move, we have to think at the same time, dual tasking, you have to figure out yourself this, if, if this is moving while thinking or thinking while movement, no moving. Move while you think. Is to think about in the supermarket, I have to go to the cheese in my country, important <clears throat> to the masala. Um, and it's over there in the shop, and then I have the rice. And moving while thinking um, is the classical double task. And they say that actually thinking by movement is better, but it's a bit more difficult to, to, to get. Uh, in the pool, so to say, you're figuring out how to do this. And um, anyway, in this moving while thinking stuff, at a certain level of exertion, yeah, you have to relate this to fall prevention. And then you come to agility, to stumble strategies, to get variability distraction. And that's something that I cannot explain um, in theory for this, and of course, that's the publicity, then you have to come to a course, isn't it? Yeah. Here you see the alternative, eh? moving while thinking, a kind of trail or parkour um, that you need um, with a little bit of speed, because agility is important, and you want to make people um, tired then. Um, or just a couple of examples in this case, you know, executive functions. <clears throat> Where, for instance, you do some work balance items or whatever kind of um, follow hand. You see, uh, I, I just took uh, 
if you one and you do uh, you do two repetitions, for instance, of all, um, and then people have to follow this. Um, <clears throat> that means uh, you do this in pairs, yeah, and you can see that yeah, number one yeah, makes two repetitions of Berg four, then number two includes Berg six, makes two repetitions of four and six, and number three. One then again has to repeat it all, and so you continue. It is summing up, yeah, like the famous game of mother goes to the market and buys, and then one after the other has to memorize. Then problem solving. Um, so Stroop is used a lot. You can do a moving Stroop, yeah, like Simon says, do a certain task, and you have to follow this when Simon says and when the teacher says. Do the task without Simon, then you shouldn't do this. Yeah, that's inhibition, no, problem solving. Concentration, of course. Um, for instance, walk together. Yeah? Walk exactly in the same way, in the same distance. Uh, you have your visual spatial uh, memory then. And so all these kinds of tasks that you could put on, including also, there you see Tai Chi uh, or Quartic Qigong. It's a bit more uh, difficult then. Yeah, but also needs artificial spatial um, attention. So you see some games, yeah, like uh, reaching out, doing the same things, copying, um, and so on. Uh, children games that are wonderful because children games are about developing executive functions. Then so do them in the pool. The uh, snake with Macmillan in front. I um, you know may may know his, his name. I have known him even. And, and so we can continue with all kinds of things, as you can see. This is not just playing and, or cleaning the floor. Um, that is making large movements. That is changing the center of gravity, uh, weight-bearing stuff, um, so on. And going to the limits of reaching and whatever is important in, uh, in fault prevention. And now a last few words about the default mode network. So the focus is mind-wandering. Um, um, and this is enhanced not only by sitting, as they thought, uh, this is uh, the network that you use when you don't do anything, uh, but also a moderate aerobic activity, when it's a kind of routine. So there the routine is important, um, can still be moderate, that means getting tired, uh, but with some rhythm, some music, with a slow beat, um, that might work. Um, and the music can even be yeah, a bit sad, as they say. So strolling on a treadmill, if you have a treadmill, could nicely do this. Right? You just walk without thinking on walking, but on other topics then. But also walking with analogies could, could be done. Or, as they say also, simple movements in martial arts can be done. Um, if yoga is okay, I don't know. Um, but you know, I know a bit more about Aichi. Um, where there was a wonderful article by Liu in 2019, where they used a simple Chinese style um, for the default mode network and the more difficult Tai Chi, because it needs visual spatial attention for the executive network. So differences there in the ease of movement are important for those networks. And don't forget, and in those networks, you use neurons. And those, those neurons, they need blood. They so have this neuro, <coughs> neurovascular coupling yeah, and not only the vascular neuronal coupling, so to say. Yeah. Um, and it also is about feeling that your body is your body. Again, you can read this, and I will skip this. Um, no, because I didn't look at the time, but time's going fast, so I have to, uh, I think I'm almost done, by the way. So I just uh, um, leave this mirror, mirror neurons can be uh, nicely used uh, when you talk about physiospatial attention in whatever way. And so you can read this also. And indeed, there in the conclusion. So patients should be tired. That not wrong, make them tired. It's good when they say, Phew, yeah, that was nice. Yeah. 
and they should still be able to see, so to say, that's the moderate intensity. And maybe it's good to make them type at first, because that means you have this increase in cerebral blood flow, and then you start thinking, or do it at the same time? But not so much first thinking and then doing. Yeah? The classical didactical way of teaching, as we see in, from physical education, is do something new first with low intensity, then you increase intensity. No, it should be the other way. As you can combine aerobic activity with balance and coordination, because it's always focused on our therapeutic goals, of course. Yeah. Play, yeah. include the brain, include the prefrontal cortex, include also emotions, yeah, the same area. So move while thinking is important. Then that patients try and explore also. Make it fun. And that's easy in the pool. Most people like the pool. Depends a bit on culture, of course, but quickly people will like the pool and the references. So let's go one by one to the references, to the references to fill the time, but there we are. And that means that we can go to the screen then and I can stop with the <coughs> screening and the PowerPoint. So, um, I don't know, my moderators, where they are? Yes. Ah, they're still here? Okay, good. Yes. <laughs> um, yes uh, any questions or whatever? It's up to you. Yes, Johan, right now there is uh, no question, but your uh, talk was really great, very informative. You have given the information in details, and there are plenty of number of research available on different different conditions, especially Parkinson, MS. There are you know, like an uh, executive function how it changes with the aquatic therapy. That also you have given a detail the um, research on it. So in the end, I want to say that use the pool when move on the land is difficult. So that the masses uh, move. That way. And I have one question, sir. So in case of spinal cord injury individuals, we see the complication like autonomic dysreflexia. So which yeah. is the mostly the related to vagal activity. So is it there is a research available that the aquatic therapy will help in spinal cord injury patient to reduce autonomic dysreflexia? Well, that's that's a, that's a very simple answer. I don't know. No, um, I've worked. I <clears throat> I've worked for um, uh, almost fifteen years in a big spinal cord department, and and um, we took as many patients to the pool um, <clears throat> for various reasons. Um, mostly, we didn't do them in the pool when they really had a crisis. Uh, then, that, that first of all. Um, uh, and of course, we have patients in the pool, especially with the higher ones. Uh, it's some, something above pH four that you really have the problems. Um, that might have had, let's say, um, this reflective this reflective signs, but were not recognized so much, and and we didn't measure, in fact, these kinds of topics. Uh, so I have to to go a bit to my to my memory, um, but my memory doesn't tell me uh, that we saw um, changes in <clears throat> this uh, this reflexia and the autonomic problems in those patients coming to the pool. Where most of those patients came to the pool once or twice a week, but I didn't really see this. I think that because of the fact that uh, you know there's really a lesion, uh, then I also never saw differences between incomplete or complete or something like this. Um, but as always, um, a question leads to new research. So um, if um, anybody is listening, I think, you know, I have these patients and I could, I could have a look. Yeah, great, yeah. Uh, but um, so I cannot, I cannot conclusively, conclusively answer, answer the question. Okay, thank you. Ipti, madam, go ahead. 
Oh uh, yeah. Okay. Thank you, Ohan. As always, such a great presentation. But I feel whoever has not experienced the aquatic therapy for them, it was really, uh, really a very good knowledge what you have given today, and the how immersion, immersion in water, even what you said, what you explained in one of the slides that the immersion in the pool also affects your cognition and memory. So that was one thing. Really, I would uh, like to give the message to everyone: try aquatic therapy. and just just try and uh, experience actually how the how it really helps to improve your cognitive function and today's webinar mostly what what ohan explained today uh, in the webinar that it's basically while moving you have to think to improve your executive function and how actually it affects your molecular level also including your synaptic activities etc uh, and from my side also there are no questions So that's it. Thank you, Ohan, again. You're welcome. Yes, and about thinking, I think I hope it's clear that, yeah, you shouldn't think about, you know, going to the supermarket and what to buy there while you're in the pool. Right? You have to think about the topics that are important um, for your balance yeah. while in the pool. That is important. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. You always, you always think. Uh, yeah. So, but yeah. Um, anyway, yeah. So in 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 one sentence, then. Um, Water offers already all kinds of free gifts, and um, mm. in terms of this cerebral flow, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, that we that we should use, um, and then not go into a simple exercise like, can you bend your knee ten times? Yeah, right. True. Good. Thank you so much. Well, thank you so much for the opportunity and. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, then we hope that, of course, we see some people in uh, in courses uh, because finally the idea the idea is, yeah, that more people, more of our colleagues, um, um, are able to explain to doctors and others um, why to go to the pool, um, with the basis, and therefore I put all the references also for those that have time enough to read. Yeah, this question was always there, so uh, in my mind at least. So. if the patient has impaired executive functions should he be taken to the pool or not or we should wait till like there are multiple things which were floating now it's like inception for me so there are too many concepts together i will have to watch <laughs> it again so thank you so much this was very 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 informative session thank you sir uh i would also like to thank dr dinesh sawan and dr dipti patil for panelist for our today's session uh i would also like to thank dr ashok sham uh, mr rahul chobe dr apurva shimpi dr neeraj athavle for uh, and entire physio tv team for giving us the opportunity to have a, such a wonderful webinar so i guess uh, will uh, uh will be stopping here Thank you so much, sir. You're welcome. Really amazing. Really amazing. Jump, jump into the pool. There we go. <laughs>